So a lot of students, myself included when I was one, asked if we need to memorize the lab values for acute care or even in inpatient rehab. If you ask two different CIs, one might say, yes, memorize them or be very familiar with them. And another might say, no, probably not because you can reference a cheat sheet or look it up online. Neither would be necessarily wrong. For example, when I oriented to acute care, I got several printouts of lab values. I never really memorized them, to be honest, because personally, I don't think my brain has the ability to remember numbers. I have always struggled with history class for this reason, such as remembering the years that events occurred in. I barely remember birthdays, several family members' phone numbers, and I'm still memorizing my newborn son's birthday, for example. So when I first learned about lab values in OT school, I thought to myself, if I want to work in this setting, it's going to be impossible to memorize these lab values. And when we say lab values, they really are just ranges, like low to high values, kind of like how hypertension is for blood pressure. Here's a chart from the American Heart Association. Notice how elevated blood pressure ranges from 120 to 129 systolic, and diastolic is less than 80. And hypertension stages begins from stage 1 ranging from 130 to 139 systolic, or 80 to 89 diastolic. So as you can see for hypertension alone, there is potentially a lot of numbers you would need to memorize, and that's just for hypertension, blood pressure, right? And that's not even a lab value. To make things even more difficult, these guidelines for the ranges may change with more research as time continues and goes on, and these ranges may change as well. So what are ranges anyways, and how do they figure out what to set for, say, anemia? The term you may hear is reference ranges, and basically what this what is considered low or high or critical is based on population norms because ranges can technically vary by age, gender, ethnicity, and so on, right? In an ideal world, you may get more specific ranges based on someone else who is very similar in demographics, conditions such as you in your age uh, bracket, gender, ethnicity, and so on. But traditionally, this would be a lot of work for, say, doctors and nurses and therapists, right, to look at even more ranges specific to the person to get more specific to that subset of the population for that client or that patient. But with the prevalence of electronic documentation, the cloud, AI, and better software, it would be interesting to see if we can go towards this direction because it matters, right? It is important to keep in mind because some diseases or conditions affect, say, ethnicity more than other ethnicities. Take, for example, sickle cell disease, right? SCD. According to the CDC, sickle cell disease occurs among one out of 365 African American births. SCD occurs among one out of 16,000 roughly Hispanic American births. So even though it's the same disease, it affects populations differently. So keep this in mind when you look at reference ranges for lab values too. Use your professional reasoning and pay attention to other factors which may put certain patients at a higher risk than another one, say, um, because based on whoever that person is, their age, gender, and so on. For example, someone who is diabetic is likely to have a higher risk for multiple things, and they may be affected more severely for symptoms when their lab values drop. So what do you do when there are so many numbers to be familiar with? You can memorize them, right? But here's one tip for you that I think I found very helpful and a lot of therapists told me that they found helpful as well is to carry around a small notebook. You can just buy one from like the dollar store or whatever and keep it on with you at all times that contains the reference ranges that you use a lot, including lab values. You could also use your phone, but sometimes your phone may be a distraction when you really want to just focus on the job and don't have a lot of time to, say, do chart review and things like that. You have the information with you in a notebook. So the next thing I'm going to share with you might be controversial and kind of provocative, but the great thing about electronic medical records is that most of the software alerts you when lab values are not looking so great. For example, my system where I work has different colors for lab values, black or, you know, normal text for normal ranges, yellow for slightly abnormal, and then more importantly, red, the color of like, say, the colors for the text for critical lab values. Your system may be a little bit different, um, but sometimes they even say like L for low, H for high for critical. If you click on the lab value itself, it will then show you the ranges and you can compare the actual value to how far off from the range it is. And this is important because I thought about making a video about actual lab 
value ranges, but it would be kind of pointless, right? Different settings, even within the same country or even with the same hospital system, maybe, may use different units and measurements based on how the lab um, measures it. And lab value ranges for what is considered critical may be critical for one hospital, but slightly abnormal for another. And as many of my viewers are from around the world, even the units of measurement are surely going to be different from the U.S., right, than in other parts of the country. When you're doing field work or even during onboarding, when you're hired for your acute care job, for example, ask if there is a cheat sheet for lab values for your work setting, right? I don't think it hurts to ask. Also, what one employer considers to be dangerous for the same lab value may not be dangerous for another employer. And that could be kind of confusing for you as an employee, right? And a therapist, because it's maybe based on different protocols, so to say. What I think is more important is to understand the big picture and what it means when a certain value is abnormally critical for the patient and how they will likely present, how it'll affect them, what does it mean in terms of the acute side of things and maybe even after. What precautions should you take and whether you should hold for therapies altogether. For example, a patient who is trending down in white blood count in the, is likely to be more fatigued and weaker than before. Another thing to keep in mind is to not rely on just, say, asking the nurse if it's okay for the patient to be seen because, well, hold on one sec, we're taking out some trash right here. Your rehab team may have more stricter protocols to restrict, say, exertion levels or again, hold therapy altogether. I hope this reassures you that lab values are not another thing that necessarily you need to memorize, but to think of really the bigger picture and what they mean and the relationship of these values and how it relates to the body system and how they're currently presenting based on their history, right? The whole bigger picture based on the holistic person and what you may be looking at and what may be, you may be concerning more based on their chart history and what may be developing and ongoing, right? So when you're conducting a chart review on a patient in acute care, it is kind of like detective work. I especially feel this way when trying to put down a diagnosis for a new patient, and especially during the evals, right? Thankfully, the detective work for the lab values is much more straightforward, right? You either have the values or you don't, and based on where you work, can you work around these numbers or is it a little sketchy, right? As mentioned earlier, many systems, computer systems, and software alert you of low, high, or critical lab values for the patient in their chart. This is a nice tool, but one thing to keep in mind is just how the software is programmed, probably. These low or high critical alerts you see that are displayed when a certain value reaches or when a certain value reaches a certain threshold that is programmed in to be alerted. So if a value, say, is even like one decimal point short of that target program value, the system may not alert you or flag it as, say, critical. But in reality, the patient, you know, is probably low or high or critical. It's just like one point, you know, on paper. But in the grand scheme of things, it might even be not even be that accurate, right? They may be critical. So keep that in mind and don't actually just look for like the, the notifications or the coloring. Look at the actual trend of things too. Another practice you should get in the habit is spotting trends. Is the value trending down, more or less stable, or is it trending up? Technically, if you have, say, only two lab draws, you only have two data points, right? And it is harder to spot a trend. And especially if it's during an acute situation when the nurses and the medical team are being very aggressive and a lot of numbers and the metabolics are changing a lot too. So you definitely need more data points, but it does give you some idea better than nothing, right? If you have, say, three or more lab draws, even better. It is easier to spot a trend of the lab values more consistently going up or down. And in acute care, patients may not have a long hospital stay necessarily, and lab draws may not be ordered, such as daily. Patients come and go. They may be discharged any second. So you don't always have this luxury. So if you say, like, two data points, you can compare the two lab values and see how far apart they are, too, um, if you only have that to work with. What is the difference between the delta, you know, and the scale and the unit of measure? And is it meaningfully a big change that you should be worried about? And whether you should pay attention and bring it up to, say, the nurse or to well, before you even work with the patient for therapy. Another thing to keep in mind is that some lab values may remain low or remain high given, say, a diagnosis or a condition, which can be a good thing for a diagnosis such as, say, troponins after a cardiac event. 
Levels of troponin can become elevated in the blood within three to six hours after, say, a heart injury, and they may remain elevated for 10 to 14 days, which is well within the length of stay, actually, for some patients in the hospital. In contrast, CK creatine kinase may double after a heart attack, but CK may go up due to other conditions, and it's generally a more general unit of measurement based on what you're looking at. So while occupational therapists don't diagnose like doctors do, understanding when to spot trends and when to ignore them or not pay so much attention to them can be very valuable for clinical decision making as an occupational therapist. And really, as you gain more experience working in acute care, you'll get better at spotting trends. You'll be more familiar with lab values in general and understanding the big clinical picture. So now let's do a brief overview of some categories of lab values. Be more specific, right? A complete blood count or CBC provides values for the concentration of red blood cells or RBCs, white blood cells or WBCs, and platelets in that sample. White blood cells are generally associated with infection, inflammation, or allergens. Red blood cells or erythrocyte values are commonly used for diagnosing, say, anemia or polycythemia also known as elevated red blood cells. Hemoglobin and hematocrit can tell you a similar story as well and can help you diagnose blood loss or even fluid imbalance. Platelets are associated with the patient's ability to form clots. And while in general you, you want your blood to clot, such as with say a cut in your integumentary system, you may sometimes not want your blood to clot systematically or even locally in your blood such as for DVTs or stroke prophylaxis. So doctors will adjust blood clotting ability depending on the patient and their unique situation. A related lab value is for serum viscosity or the thickness of blood as measured by the INR or International Normalized Ratio. This one is commonly referenced for stroke prophylaxis with the use of anticoagulants and the risk of bleeding increases with a higher INR. The times, like the clock time, are also measures of serum viscosity, such as thromboplastin time for heparin and prothrombin time for coumadin. The longer the time, the higher the risk of bleeding. So in terms of INR and times, like words containing thromb, like T-H-R-O-M-B, the higher the risk of bleeding. There's actually a whole flow chart that your facility might have, like your therapy um, might give you whether or not to basically mobilize a patient who has known DVT based on how long they have been receiving an intervention such as heparin for stroke prophylaxis. Next, a basic metabolic panel or BMP is a group of tests for the electrolytes such as sodium and potassium as well as acid-base balance. Components include sodium, potassium, which is important for cellular functions of nerves, muscles, and calcium for, say, muscle contractions and overall growth of cells and bones. Chloride for fluid balance and acid-base balance. Remember this one, like the household cleaner, like Clorox, which is like an acid base. I'm not sure about the pH, but phosphate for acid-base balance as well. And energy storage. To remember phosphate, the first two letters are pH, so acid-base balance. You're getting kind of nerdy. Then there's a panel for a test of organ function, such as the kidneys, blood, urea, nitrogen, or BUN, and serum, creatine, assess the kidney function. So remember BUN, the shape of a kidney kind of looks like a thickened hot dog bun, get it? To remember serum creatine, what creatine does is it's a waste product from the energy producing process of the muscles. So creatine, creatinine, I can never pronounce this, is actually a waste product of creatine. Because the kidneys help to excrete this waste product as urine, it's associated with usually kidney function and how well the kidneys can eliminate creatinine from the body. What about the liver? Liver function is assessed by its ability to clear out things like proteins, but also albumin and bilirubin. So labs will measure serum albumin. How you can remember albumin is liver has the words L-I-V-E, live. You live to take photos for a photo album? I don't know. Physiologically, excess bilirubin is the main cause of jaundice due to the dysfunction of the liver. Bilirubin is also brownish yellow, like the color of a Reuben sandwich. 
glucose, you're all familiar with it, it and it's associated with the, for the criteria for diabetes, right? This one you should probably know pretty well. The reference values for glucose are 70 to 100. A similar lab is the high A1C, and this shows average blood glucose in the last three months for the patient. The T's now help measure thyroid function, right? So T3 and T4 and TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. The next panel is acid-based disorders, such as respiratory and metabolic alkalosis, or pH greater than 7. pH less than 7 is re respiratory and metabolic acidosis. This can be a whole video in itself, but just know that it can be measured by pH, as well as bicarbonate, abbreviated as HCO3, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, abbreviated as PaCO2. Lipid panels are pretty self-explanatory. They measure good and bad cholesterol, such as HDL and LDL, which are the lipoproteins. Triglycerides, also you're probably well familiar with, are the total cholesterol that are measured. So I covered some of the labs for cardiac events and diseases earlier, such as troponin and creatine. Remember how creatine helped us to measure muscle use and excretion in the kidneys? Creatinine kinase is released to the blood as well due to cardiac muscle injuries. They are actually the markers for brain and skeletal muscle injury as well. So CK is just a broad term. They further divide that into CK, say, BB for brain tissue, CKMB for cardiac muscle, and CKMM for skeletal muscle. These are the most common lab values. It can seem kind of overwhelming, right? I kind of power through them, but when you break it down into the categories, basically in, in themselves, and understand what they measure and how it relates to the physiology, you can kind of then incorporate memory tricks to remember what they actually do. I hope this helps. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel, OT Dude. And I'll see you all in the next one.